The skies were clear, the sun shining, and the hot air breathed down the necks of the citizens across Seattle. A normal day in this year's unusually dry spring. However, it would turn out to be anything but normal. It was on this glorious day that the city of Seattle burned to the ground. It was on this glorious day that the Great Seattle Fire made its impact. Before the fire, the city of Seattle would have appeared to be an average frontier town. Smelly, ramshackle, really what you'd consider a wild west town. Seattle's economy consisted primarily of logging, a rather slow business that showed no real initiative for profit. Most of the buildings were made out of wood. The majority of these were also one to two stories tall. They were densely packed and were constructed poorly. The fire department was very minimal, if you can even say they had one. It was strictly volunteer and there were no professionals on the force. In addition to this, Seattle had its own breed of people. You could describe Seattle as... Pretty much dominated by Euro-Americans. You know, there weren't many Africans here then or even Asians, but still it was quite metropolitan because there were so many Im immigrants from different countries in Europe largely that you had a really a, quite a, a multilingual community. One of these citizens was a young Swedish carpenter by the name of John E. Back. On the afternoon of June 6th, Back was in Victor Claremont's woodworking shop, which was located in the Pontius Building on 1st and Madison. This was Back's account of the fire in an interview that was held by the Post Intelligencer. I cut some balls of glue and put them in the glue pot on the stove. I put in some shaving where there was little fire. After a while, somebody said, look at the glue and everything take fire. Sometime after 2.15, the glue boiled over, caught fire, and spread to the floors, which were covered by wood chips and turpentine. Back then tried to put out the fire with water, but that mixed with the turpentine and also caught fire. Rapidly, the fire spread all around the room, and Claremont's shop, along with the entire M.J. Pontius building, went up in flames. So started the Great Seattle Fire. The flames were first sighted from steamboats docked on Elliott Bay, the warning was issued at a quarter to three on the afternoon of June 6, 1889. Swiftly responding, Engine Company No. 1 fastened two lines to a hydrant at the corner of Front and Columbia Streets, two blocks south of the fire. Meanwhile, Engine Company No. 2 dropped the hose under a nearby dock and took a strategic position behind the burning building. Crowds flocked to the source of the fire and cheered as the firemen fearlessly raised their hoses. Slowly, the fire appeared to become controllable as the flames began to erupt towards the north end of the building. Firemen began to realize a problem with the Pontius Fire that chilled their confidence. The downtown water pressure of 120 pounds could only support three or four decent streams of water for 20 minutes after the firemen began using them. As a result, the hydrants were quite useless. Although it was expected to severely impede the fire, the four-story brick opera house was completely decimated within minutes after its wooden roof ignited and burst into flames. One hour later, the flames spread to two hardware stores that contained an estimated 20 to 50 tons of ammunition and gunpowder. The result, a barrage of bullets, was also a pair of exploding oil, paint, and alcohol drums, which were set off by the fire. By 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the flames spread to the road, which were incidentally filled with sawdust. In no time at all, the roads also ignited. Moving at the rate of a football field per half hour, fire reached Seattle's densest business district. At this point, the fire was so hot that buildings collapsed and melted even before the fire touched them. By six, the fire destroyed six wharves and it began to consume the merchandise that had been loaded upon them by the mayor's teams. For three more hours, the fire lit up the night and eventually burned itself out. Slowly, the citizens of Seattle crawled out from under ashes and saw the full scale of the destruction of their city. Soon after the fire, British author Rudyard Kipling visited Seattle. In his journal he writes, The town was built upon a hill. In the heart of the business quarters there was a horrible black smudge, as though a hand had come down and rubbed the place smooth. I know now what being wiped out means. Truly, the city was indeed wiped out for reports had shown that the amount of damage was enormous. Every newspaper, hotel, telegraph, railroad depot, and wharf in the city had been completely destroyed. An estimated 120 acres, or 25 city blocks, had been destroyed. The Fry Opera House, the Yesler Building, Dexter and Horton Bank, Doxton and the Hotel, each was a shade of its past glory. Although no one died as a result of the fire, thousands of people were displaced and 5,000 men lost their jobs. 
the city estimated its losses at over $8 million, and that number didn't even include personal losses or those of water and electrical services. Today, historians estimate the total losses at over $20 million. The city did not spare much time for mourning, and instead began to organize relief efforts immediately. Hardly had the flames died out when anxiety and dread gave place to cheerfulness, confidence, and determination. Almost immediately after the fire, they started to regroup, and their optimism came back, and the tragedy really turned into a kind of triumph for the community as they started to rebuild their city, and within two years, he wouldn't have recognized it. Instead of relocating, most businesses quickly rebuilt upon their ashes and erected temporary white tents from which they conducted their business. Soon, Seattle's covered in white tents were spotted the burnt district. Workers not only operated their businesses in these tents, but they made their homes in these canvases. This not only helped the customers, but it also helped these businesses amass a large revenue. The most immediate relief arrived in the form of the Tacoma Relief Bureau. The day after the fire, a train rolled into Seattle carrying several cartloads, blankets, tents, and food for Seattleites. News of the fire did not stay secret. Well, we lucked out in a sense. The Great Seattle Fire happened a day in Seattle history when no other major tragedies occurred. So. We got all of the press, we got all of the attention, and actually an awful lot of the aid. It couldn't have happened at a better time. Soon, donations and telegrams offering aid began pouring in from all over the country. The list of those donating to aid the fire victims was many pages in length. In no time, the Seattleites had enough money and provisions to recuperate. The citizens of Seattle wasted no time in rebuilding their city. On June 7th, just one day after the fire, Mayor Robert Moran called several prominent city and business leaders to a meeting at the Armory. Having learned their lesson, the Assembly decreed that only brick buildings would be allowed in the Burnt District. After the fire, 117 brick buildings were erected, which cost the city the equivalent of $140 million today. Comparatively, the city spent only $20 million on wooden buildings. Within a week of the fire, the city went to work on a new building ordinance. The ordinance required all buildings to be at least two stories high, all walls to be at least 12 inches thick, the foundations to be at least four feet beneath the grade, and division walls to prevent fires from spreading. Next, the city replatted and regraded nearly all of the streets in the burnt district. In the course of this action, the streets were raised 22 feet. This allowed them to be widened from the 60 feet to the ambitious 88 feet. The new streets were paved with stone and iron. Four months after the fire, the City Council authorized a professional fire department and 32 men were hired on the spot. Also, the City bought the fireboat Duwamish, two more fire engines, and horse teams. In addition to this, the women of the city got together and formed a beautification program which planted 3,000 new trees on the streets of Seattle. The Great Seattle Fire paved the way for the Klondike Gold Rush. Did the fire influence the capacities of Seattle to react to the gold rush and to become the center for the, the miners that were going off to the gold rush, I, I would say certainly. Traveling through Seattle, many citizens developed an attitude that they would fight through adversity and emerge successful. The newly rebuilt and spirited city of Seattle played an extremely significant role in the Klondike and helped many people achieve wealth and success. Although the Great Seattle Fire was indeed a tragic event, it contains elements of triumph for it united the community and spurred the birth of a new Seattle. Truly, more good than bad came out of the fire. In 1885, the population of Seattle numbered 9,687. In December 1889, just six months after the fire, the population of Seattle skyrocketed to an astounding 42,000. With the dramatic increase in population came a dramatic increase in revenue. In the aftermath of the fire, the city funds gained $5 million which Seattleites used to reconstruct the burn district and improve their city. On July 2nd, the Seattle Times confidently proclaimed, Like the imaginary bird of ancient fable, Seattle has already begun to rise from the ashes of her former self and is putting on the raiment of magnificence and greatness. It is true that Seattle, an average frontier town, died in the Great Fire of June 6, 1889. But on this day, something new arose from the ashes. Seattle, Phoenix of the Northwest. <laughs>